book of Daniel, chapter 7. I'd like to read this passage and, by God's grace, exposit it. I think that's a word. Exposit. Expose. (laughs) Talk about it. (laughs) Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon its feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, and devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and beheld a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things." I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels like a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened." I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom that which will not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Oh, to receive a direct revelation from God is no light thing, very costly. He's grieved. He just saw visions from the Most High God. This takes place when Daniel is 67 years old. You can tell, but you can place it because it says it's the first year of Belshazzar. Daniel's 67 years old. And this takes place, because we were looking at the book of Daniel, 40 years after Nebuchadnezzar's vision. This is the first of Daniel's visions. He only interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the great statue? That's the vision that controls this whole, this whole prophecy. Forty years later, Daniel has a vision. And this is the vision. And what this vision is, is an elaboration on Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Nebuchadnezzar's vision is, is the vision from the perspective of a man, a pagan humanistic king. But God shows him the future of the humanistic uh, enterprise, of, of, of the, fu- the future of Gentile rule over Israel. And in his vision, it's a man, a massive glorified man of gold and silver and bronze and iron. And this man standing there strapping and powerful. That would be the way a pagan king would see the future of world history. And the man is standing there, but then the rock comes and crushes him. 
But when Daniel sees the same thing from the, from the perspective of a holy prophet of God, he doesn't see a glorified man. He sees ravenous beasts. The kingdoms of the world are ravenous beasts. America is no different than any other. Horrifying beasts. Crushing and hurting people by their pro- policies. Just as an aside, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton tying foreign aid to poor African countries with forcing them to change their laws against homosexuality. Don't kid yourself. We're a beast. And we're doomed. We're under judgment. Well, what's the vision mean? I, it's mystical, isn't it? It's fantastic. It's otherworldly. But I would seek to demystify it, to just give a simple explanation of what he saw. He saw the same thing Nebuchadnezzar saw, only from God's perspective. That these are the four kingdoms, the four Gentile kingdoms, that will be given the rule over God's people. Remember, Moses said, if you ever go away from me, I'll let the Gentiles rule you. Well, they didn't believe him until he he showed them that he would. And Gentiles have been ruling over Israel ever since. Up to this day, Gentiles rule over Israel. There's not been a period since 70 A.D. or even, even earlier than that. The Romans were ruling over them. There's not been a period since the Babylonian captivity that Israel has not been ruled by Gentiles. They have not had their autonomy. It's been taken away from them because of the judgment of God. God said, if you don't be faithful to me, I'll let the Gentiles rule over you. And that's what's happened. Jesus refers to this when he says, Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. See, there's a time for the Gentiles to rule. I've always wondered, why didn't Israel just take over the Temple Mount in the 1967 war? Why did they give it right back to the Muslims to be the custodians of it? They could have. They they have every reason to. The nation wanted to. Why couldn't they? God wouldn't have let it because the times of the Gentiles aren't ready. They're not done. Now, let let me demystify this. The first beast that looks like a lion and has wings of an eagle, that's Babylon. That's Babylon. The lion's so majestic, so powerful, so fierce, and the wings so swift. The eagle is a majestic bird. Babylon is the head of gold, the greatest kingdom of the Gentiles to rule over Israel. But it says the heart of the, the heart of the beast was given the beast was given the heart of a man. And basically what happened to the nations, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He went mad, he became a beast. We already talked about that. And then after seven years, God gave him back his mind. He became a man again, set on his feet. But shortly after that, Babylon ceased to be. It was taken over by the second beast, Medo-Persia. Medo-Persian Empire is not a lion, it's a bear. A bear is powerful and a bear is fierce, but a bear is not a lion. A bear is not majestic and kingly. But I wouldn't want to get run across a bear anywhere. And then the bear's mouth had three ribs. Well, Medo-Persian Empire only became an empire after they took over three kingdoms. Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Daniel saw this all before it happened. See, that's the thing about these prophecies. One thing about these prophecies. Listen, we live in a day of false prophecy where God's people are sinning by following people who make predictions consistently in the name of Jesus that never come to pass, and they still follow him. The worse Benny Hinn or Todd Ben Lee or these people get, the more popular they become because God's people are faithless. They don't believe in him. They're not faithful and loyal to the word of God. But here is a prophet who actually makes visions and says in the name of the Lord, this is what's going to happen. And hundreds of years later, to the detail, they happen. Daniel is so accurate that scholars just dismiss him out of hand. Couldn't be. Why? Too accurate. But I'll tell you who believed in Daniel. Jesus. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, the consummate chapter on the end of the world. The the reader of Daniel is going to understand what's going on. Let me get back to these visions. 
He sees a third beast like a leopard. I mean, we go into these beasts because Daniel elaborates on them later. But that's the, that's the Greeks, the Greece, the Greece of Alexander the Great. The leopard is not a lion or a bear. A bear is a huge, lumbering, powerful thing. But when you read history, which happened hundreds of years after Daniel predicted this, the, the, the Persians were so big they could have armies of, of a million people. This is the ancient world. They had million-man armies. Greece was just a little backwater. Hillbillies. But Alexander the Great and his father, Philip of Macedon, lured per- Persians into battles that were favorable to small companies of people. They actually defeated this behemoth. And then when Alexander died, they said, who should we leave the kingdom to? He says, leave it to the strongest. And the strongest was four generals. The kingdom was split in four. See, notice what he said. The beast had four heads. We'll get more into this because Daniel does. All this happened hundreds of years later. But it focuses in like a telescope. It's the last beast. The last world empire that rules Israel. By the way, as a person that loves history, I, I, I read Daniel a couple times. I thought, why don't you talk about the Chinese? They have great empires. Why don't you talk about the great empires of Africa? Why don't you talk about the Indians? They have great empires. God is only concerned with salvation history here, the things that surround Israel. That's why he, 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 he narrows in on these empires. These are the ones that were given custodianship of God's chosen people when they went astray, when they went into sin. These are the ones that were allowed to rule over them. That's why that he doesn't talk about every empire in the world and give you every detail of history in the world. It's salvation history that he narrows in on. And in this vision, he especially focuses on the fourth empire, which is so different than every other empire. Let's see. And it's different in such a way that he can't even describe it like a beast because there's nothing that he can think of or nothing he could imagine that would typify it. It's not like a lion, not like a bear, not like a leopard. So different. How is it different? Well, it's different in this sense that it's the longest. See, In the original vision that this is a reflection of, Daniel 2, it's the legs. It's the longest empire. Okay? And there's several stages. you got the waist, the unified stage. That's the Roman Empire. But then it becomes two legs. Daniel saw all this centuries before it happened. The Roman Empire was split in two. You had Rome and you had Constantinople. You even got this religiously. You got the Roman Catholic Church. You got the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay. You got it in the Cold War. We had the East and the West. You had Moscow and Russia. You got this dualism all through what the remnants of the Roman Empire. These two legs. That's one of the stages. And then you get to the stage of the feet, which is iron mixed with clay. And, and I wish I had time to talk about that. But iron is, is, is power. Iron is strength. Iron is brutality. Clay is democracy, which creates a weakness. Muslims are taking advantage of our weakness because we're a free and open country. You think you can set up subversive churches over there in Saudi Arabia? You kidding? But they can set up mosques here. Why? Iron mixed with clay. We're really, 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 really strong here in the West. We could crush Mecca if we had the will to. But we're really, really weak here because of the iron mixed with clay. And then the last stage of the last empire that runs God's people. Because make no mistake about it, Israel is not an autonomous and sovereign nation. God won't let it be until the times of the Gentiles are over. Israel needs the West, especially the last custodian of it was, was America. And the spectacle of Barack Hussein Obama walking out of a room with Netanyahu not even taking him to dinner after he crossed the ocean to come and see him, saying, I'm going to go eat. I don't care what you're going to do. Insulting and humiliating and degrading him. This is all part of God's judgment that's being played out that Moses predicted, that all the prophets predicted. But Daniel's showing us what happens right at the end. 
There's another stage to come. It's going to be ten toes or ten horns. Ten toes in Daniel 2. Ten horns in Daniel 7. Ten horns in Revelation Somehow or other, there's going to be a world order that divides the world into ten regions. A one world government, a one world order that wants to resolve the, quote, Israel problem or the Palestinian problem or however you want to say it. That takes up on itself, as the prophet Zechariah said, the heavy, heavy stone in the way of progress called Jerusalem that unites the whole world against a little postage stamp sized country about as big as New Jersey in that stage there'll be ten godless leaders over these ten regions but one of them a very small diminutive seemingly powerless leader called the little horn will rise up. That's what he sees here. It says, I considered the horns, verse 8. There came up among them another little horn. A little horn. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. This is what happens right before the end. Don't think there's not already a globalism being, getting ready to be put in place. There is. A world unity. A world reshuffling. And don't think, well, that'd be centuries before that could happen. Look how the deck's been shuffled just in the last ten years. Just everything just coming one after another. Like in this vision, he's standing by the sea. It's the Great Sea. What's the Great Sea? It's not the Mediterranean, not the Atlantic, not the Pacific. The Great Sea is the biblical metaphor for all the peoples of the world. The people are like the sea. Restless. The Gentiles. Mankind's turbulent and, and restless history. He sees the sea agitated. And right one after another comes these different world orders. Well, the last one, the last one is being set up. And in that time, he says, you'll see a little diminutive leader, a minor leader, become a major leader all at once. And he'll pluck up by the roots somehow three of these leaders. And he says he's got eyes like the eyes of a man. In other words, eyes there is a me- metaphor for intelligence. Very intelligent. But he's also known for having a mouth that speaks great things. Now, what do, what do we mean by great things? Boastful things. Self-exalting things. See, Paul referred to this. Hold your finger at Daniel 7 and look in Second Thessalonians 2. See, we already see this spirit among our world leaders. They all seem to have jettisoned any trace of Christianity or religion. Just thrown it out. They could say anything. And they boast, all of them, against the Most High. And they blaspheme against Israel. He says, verse 7, Genesis chapter, or 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, mystery of iniquity. Oh, wait. No, no, not 7. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many believe that Jesus is coming? And then, by our gathering together unto Him. And that word gathering together is a beautiful word. Episunagogo. What it means is our upper assembly. You get the word synagogue from it, assembly. Our upper assembly. What's he referred to there? Anybody? The rapture. The rapture. In view of the coming of our Lord and in view of the coming rapture, that you don't be soon shaken of mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no one deceive you by any means. That day cannot come except there come a falling away first. We are right there right now. There is a huge defection from the faith. Massive. Most people are oblivious to it. 
But there has never been a greater falling away from the Christian faith as there is right now. People are following false prophets. People are joining the Christian church with Ms. Islam. Other Christian leaders are marrying and ordaining homosexuals. We are in the midst of a tremendous... People say, this is the greatest revival ever. This is the greatest time ever. Never has been so much power. Are you kidding? This is the falling away we were warned about. And this is the reason why Jesus said, it's an open question. Will the Son of Man even even find faith when he comes to the earth? He doesn't answer that question. The day, day can't come unless you come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, I don't believe Obama is the Antichrist. But I believe the adulation and worship surrounding that man is important. It is pointing us to that spirit of Antichrist that's in the world. The way people are treating him, the way people treat certain other world leaders is going to be a shadow of the way they're going to treat the one coming. I want to say something else, too. Don't think that I'm being ridiculous. You know all this superhero craze that the kids are getting into? Sure, on the one hand, it's all good fun. When I was a kid... We read comic books when we could sneak them by my mother, okay? And we were all into Green Lantern and Green Hornet and everything like that. But there is some sick aspiration underneath this, some desire for a Superman like Nimrod who could push away God and the judgment that's coming to this earth, some evil prodigy who can save us from the need to repent and the need to really soul search and break off our sins. The latest blasphemy is that Marvel Comics is going to come out with a gay superhero. Look, take a look at, at what it's all about. Now, I don't say this just because it's an interesting curiosity. We're raising kids. A lot of these superheroes are just like uh, Greek mythology. Well, the Greeks were all homosexuals, too. The commercial I saw for Superman, I went to a movie and there was a preview for Superman. A voice seemingly from space or from the heavens said, they will not listen, therefore I'm sending my son. Superman came into a barn. Does that sound familiar? No, I'm not saying it's a sin to go see X-Men or whatever. I'm not even talking on that level. Everyone's got to do what their conscience tells them to do and let your kids do what your conscience tells you to let them do. But don't be stupid. There's a bad spirit underneath this. There's an evil spirit. A spirit that's coming to seduce the whole world away from God. And a tremendous religious test is coming to professing Christians as well as everybody else. A huge religious test. The ramifications of which mean the difference between heaven and hell. Look what it says about him. Don't you remember verse 5 when I told you? Now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity is already working. Only he who hinders will hinder till he be taken out of the way. Then will that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, and he will destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Oh, yes, that's how it's going to be accepted. Real power. Awful miracles. They won't look awful, though, to the undiscerning. They'll look wonderful. But they will, when he comes, he comes with power. He comes with miracles. He comes with signs. Now, we believe in miracles, and we believe in signs, and we believe in wonders, and we believe in power. This whole thing isn't even so much about the person himself, the Antichrist, the little horn, the one who speaks great things. This has more to do with his constituency, that they will accept him because of the miracles. People think, impossible. Are you kidding? There's a guy out there right now named Todd Bentley who performs miracles. 
who in the process of his ministry left his wife, took up with another woman, and is just as received today as he was before. You don't think people are ready to chuck out all faith, all truth, all allegiance to God in the service of power, signs, and wonders? It's a frightening day that we live in. And if they can't see through obvious charlatans like Todd Bentley and Benny Hinn, what are they going to do when the real thing comes? A little horn. Daniel saw a little horn speaking great things. Go to Revelation 13. A little horn speaking great things. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. They can't help it. They have to, they have to do it. And when they get their power, they must do it. They have to say, well, the ocean levels will go down when I'm in power and this and that and the other and then promise the spirit. They have to. It's the spirit. The spirit of Antichrist. Revelation 13, verse 1. Similar to Daniel 7, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads the name of blasphemy. How do you get a name of blasphemy on your head? Well, the Pope has a name of blasphemy on his head. For he has a special tiara that says, Vicarus Christus, which means substitute for Christ. Blasphemy. The Pope is blasphemy. Many of the world leaders do blasphemy regularly. I remember on a smaller level, the uh, a leader in one of the, I think it was Ghana, elected to power, put up a statue with, of himself and underneath inscribed a prayer. Our government, which art in Acre, give us today our daily bread. Blasphemy. The Caesars were called Lord and Savior. Blasphemy. Deify a man. That's why I'm telling you, be careful of the superhero craze. Once men are deified, all manner of evil is possible. There's a bad spirit blowing, beloved. I'm not here to tell you do's and don'ts and set up new rules for TV watching. You be, you be a mature Christian. You do what you have to do. But do it with your eyes open. There's a terrible spirit blowing. And part of it wants to get you to accept everything. To break us down to where we accept what would be unacceptable to us 20 years ago. Do you think 20 years ago evangelicals would ever consider joining with Muslims to morally renovate the country? And yet we have Chrislam. We have Chrislam. Ouch. He says... The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. Satan gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Well, that's one of the signs. For in the very beginning of the Bible, he said, The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head but he shall bruise his heel. This is the one that has a head wound. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Do you understand? They worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? We sing a song here in this church. Who is like unto you? Who is like unto you? O Lord among gods, who is like unto you? Fearful in holiness, doing wonders, glorious in praises. Who is like unto you? But they will say, who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? Thus, they will worship him. And the warning here is not that they're going to do like us and bow down and lift their hands. Not initially. What happens is politics becomes worship because all the expectations of people are placed in something fallible, something less than God, something less than holy. And compromises are made where you accept the unacceptable. Now we have a Mormon, a man who believes that Jesus and Satan are half-brothers, about ready to become the president of the United States. 
who can do this? Who can promote this? Who can do it? Verse 5 is where I was going to focus on. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. He's going to speak great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Here's another thing. There's a spirit of blasphemy. The language is much worse than I ever remembered it in my whole life. It's so worse that it's actually becoming commonplace even for some unwary Christians to pick up the language. And we have heard preachers actually cursing in pulpits. What is the meaning of blasphemy? Go back to Daniel 7. What is the meaning of blasphemy? Well, it says you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, if you're going to make ten laws that cover all of human behavior, and you only got ten to make, would you make one like that? Of all the other things you could address, tax fraud, genocide, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's one of the ten laws. Yep. Why? Well, because God is above us. And what is the meaning of blasphemy? I won't have anybody above me. Nobody is above me. I don't fear anyone's name. I use it however I want. I, a little, tiny, depraved man, is going to reach up above with his tongue and pull down everything that he perceives is above him. God, sex, marriage, the sanctity of life. He's got to pull it down. Why? Because it's above him. And he's got to profane it with his mouth and his deeds. Why? Because nothing can be above the self. Remember what Paul said? He exalts himself above all that is God or that is worshipped as God. So Daniel saw him speaking great things. That's the first two visions. He sees the beast and then he sees the little horn. That's the second vision. He sees four and all. The third vision is thrones are set up. Oh, I'm so glad for this one. He's taken into the angelic courts. Thrones are set up everywhere. But the massive throne in the center. He sees the Ancient of Days. This is the name for God the Father. The Ancient of Days. He's not ancient. For God doesn't age. God cannot get old. Another translation has the source of all days. Every day that we have is a gift from Him. The source of time. The source of days, the center of the universe, the ancient of days. His hair is white like wool, not because he's old, but because he's pure. And he's wise. He sits on the throne attended by myriads. There's a rough estimate how many thousands of thousands and ten thousands and ten thousands of holy angels minister unto him. And judgment is set. Oh, it says his throne is like a fiery flame. This is the glory. And the wheels, like a burning fire. This is judgment. And a stream of fire issues out. The judgment's already gone forth against these nations. And then it says in verse 11, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. Every one of those blasphemous words, every one of those proud boasts, not one of them fell to the ground. All were put into account. And on that day and on that throne, because of the words that that, fourth, uh, that little horn spoke, he says, I beheld until even the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Well, judgment happens. The beast is slain. His body destroyed. 
and he's given to the burning flame. What that's, that is just echoed in Revelation 19. Then the beast and the false prophet were thrown into, alive into the lake of fire that burns forever. Whoa, what a vision. What about the other three beasts? Concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. What's he saying there? The fourth beast is different in a lot of ways. It lasts a long time. What is the fourth beast? Oh, you could say it's the Roman Empire, but it's not just the Roman Empire. It's the Western hegemony that came out of the Roman Empire that leads right up to this day. It includes America, the Anglosphere, Europe, the Western world that has basically the last custodian of Israel. That's the last beast. The first phase was the Roman Empire. The second phase is the two legs of the Roman Empire. The third phase that I think we're in right now is iron mixed with clay. And the last phase, somehow ten divisions of the world. And a little horn that rises to the top and makes great boasts and blasphemes God. And by the time that he comes to power, the people are already conditioned to hear blasphemy and to believe in a superman with superpowers that can alleviate this world's problems without repentance. Is anybody here? No need to turn to God. No need to even turn morally. How about a homosexual superman? What a betrayal. Right? Well, he says, the rest of the beasts, they didn't get destroyed right away. And that's proven true, too. Babylon Babylon was never totally destroyed. It will be. There's prophecies it will be, but it never happened yet. Babylon's still there. We had a military base there. Actually, the farmers there take the bricks from the Tower of Babel and use them for fence lines. There's still that's that, there's that many of them. Babylon's still there. It's called Iraq. Persia's still there. Notice it's in the news. Iran. Never been an empire since. But it wasn't destroyed. Not like the fourth beast is going to be destroyed. It's still been around. It's an ancient civilization. It only became Iran in the 1930s. But it's been around for a long time. It's called Persia. Greece, still there. Rome, when it gets destroyed, when the last empire gets destroyed, when the western hegemony gets destroyed, it won't be like the other three. They just kind of faded away. Rotted. They still exist as a, as a memorial. Although, notice they're all in the news again. <laughs> they're all in world attention again. But when the last empire is destroyed, it'll be cataclysmic. It'll be the equivalent of the stone that hit the statue and crushed it. At the coming of the Lord. This brings us to the fourth vision. I saw in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Daniel's projected way far off into the future. And he sees what happens right before Jesus comes back. Immediately before. See, why, why, why is Jesus actually coming back to the world? Hold your finger here and look at Zechariah 14. You just give me five minutes here. Why is Jesus actually literally coming back? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but there's one specific reason. Zechariah 14, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. 
Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city will go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Jesus literally rises from His throne to come back. Because in the fury of the nations, they turn on Israel and especially Jerusalem and they just about wipe it out. That's when he comes back. Because remember, go back to Daniel 7. God promised them a kingdom. But they haven't had a kingdom for a long time. They can't. It's the times of the Gentiles. They sinned. But God's not done with them. And the last custodian of them is going to be the worst of all. The last custodian. I mean, look what's just happened in the last century. Holocaust. What do people say after the Holocaust? Never again, never again. Have you seen France lately? Have you heard English politicians lately? How about our State Department? Look at the Jew hatred and the Jew blame. And you know what the last straw is? How about Christian churches turning against Israel? It's happening all around you. He's coming. But what happens right before he comes? Daniel saw it in a vision. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. See, the the most repetitive designation that Jesus gave himself is the Son of Man. The Son of Man. People think Son of Man, that means he's a man. No, it's a supernatural figure, as you can see here. He's in the throne room of God. He's presented before the Ancient of Days. And verse 14 There was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom that which will never be destroyed. Come quickly, Jesus, come quickly. That's when Israel receives the kingdom, when the ultimate Israel, the embodiment of Israel, goes to the throne at the end and takes the kingdom. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body. The visions of my head troubled me. I stood near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which will rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High will take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Even forever and ever. Now these saints are the Jewish people. It's not talking about the church. Daniel's not talking about the church. This is the Jewish people. Daniel's concern is what happens to the Jewish people between now our exile and the time when we get the kingdom? And the whole book is the answer. Saints will get the kingdom. Israel will be saved. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, who devoured broken pieces and stamped the rest with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more fierce than his fellows. I behold in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. This is another thing. We all remember 1967, or a lot of us do anyway. (laughs) Wow, the IDF, the Israeli army, they just beat eight armies. Yeah, but in 73 they were almost wiped out. In 82 they went into Lebanon, but they were pushed back by the UN. In 92 they had Palestinian Liberation Army cornered, but the world made them let them go. Let these sewer rats go. Every single time since. They went to war in Lebanon recently. That's the, the Muslim world declared victory. They think they, they, they won. They pushed them back. Each one, they get closer and closer to extinction. The last one, 
<laughs> Their back is so against the wall. But they actually get to the point where they cry out, have mercy, oh God, have mercy. Let the Messiah save us. I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. The time came that the saints should possess the kingdom. Then he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth, which will be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he will subdue three kings. And he will speak great words against the Most High and will wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and laws. Oh, I wish I could go into detail on that. The Antichrist spirit wants to change the times and laws. The primal laws. Everything between Genesis 1 and Genesis 11 is the primal law for humanity. In other words, not just for Christians, not just for Jews, for everybody. Marriage, the role of the male and the female, death penalty, meeting, eat, meeting, me, meeting, eating meat, <laughs> worshiping God. Every single one of those is being repudiated by the leaders of the world. Every single one, even seed bearing seed after its kind. Each of those that seek to change the times and laws. And they'll be given into the hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. For three and a half years, the Jews will be given fully into the hand of their enemy. The judgment shall sit and they will take away the dominion to consume and to destroy it at the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me. My countenance changed in me. But I kept the matter in my heart. Thank the Lord he wrote it down, though, right? Amen. Father, <laughs> there's a great big picture that you give us glimpses of. And I pray that you'll keep doing that, Lord. I pray that we'll be faithful to you. I pray that we'll witness and gain souls for Christ. I pray that we'll hold forth the truth in a truthless age. Lord, we don't, we don't uh, consider that a given. Only if you keep us, only if you preserve us, only if you fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all.